Hi, this is Martin Van Riel, and you're listening to the MX Endurance Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the MX Endurance Podcast, where we look at everything that's been happening in the world of endurance sports. My name is Tim Ford, and I'm joined by the penultimate legend, the sexy shepherdess, the sexiest voice in triathlon himself, James Baljimbo. Welcome back to the podcast. Here we are, mate recording again and you're back where you're meant to be in your home recording studio down in australia with a nice shiny bike behind you looking a little bit more tired than you normally do and currently obstructing the screen with a pillow but uh how are you mate you okay i just realized that i hadn't put my i normally so my eyes aren't looking down at the screen all the time i try to put a, a box under my laptop when i do this and i realized i hadn't done it so that's what you just saw audio listeners will have no idea uh, what we're talking about, but head to YouTube if you want to find out. Uh, I'm good, mate. I'm a little bit jet lagged. I've, I've uh, got back from Norway uh, overnight and have had not enough sleep, which is less than desirable. But you'll you'll notice last week, I promised that there'd be a new bike behind me and there in fact is not. Uh, I went in today and saw it. It is there. It is ready to be built. I'm having the fit tomorrow, so it should be there next week. But mate, I'm pretty excited about new bike day. But James, I've thought of something, mate. Uh-oh. We we. We talk about how you need to come up with a nickname for me, yeah, right. and I think and I think I know what it is. I, I I think I've actually given myself my own nickname on this podcast, but I think it's a nickname that I've it's that a, I've. It's earned. a good thing because being British, I'm not capable of coming up with a nickname that is broadcastable to the masses, mate. We, you know. Oh, I thought it was going to be the master of triathlon. That's I think that should be the nickname because. I tr- predicted a certain athlete was going to win Dubai seventy point three over the weekend, and people thought I was a madman. People thought Tim Ford doesn't know. What he's talking about? Why would you go against Christian Blumenfeld, James Bale? He thought he was a believer. He went with Daniel Becker. God, he didn't have faith that Martin Van Riel is the real deal, like I did, and I was correct, as I often am. James Bale, what do you reckon? Yeah, well, I mean, okay, so a, a, even a stock clock is right twice a day, eh? This is what springs <laughs> to mind. But no, I mean, totally. I was. We, we'll discuss this race in detail a bit later in the podcast, but. I was very pleased to see the result as it shook out, even though I'd picked Daniel for the win because I know Daniel's a very strong contender and a second place is a strong result. But I was pleased to see. Um, <laughs> I just good... realized you, you said that a broken clock is, is right twice a day. It is a, it is a year since I made my prediction for the Clash Miami podium where I picked Jan Fredino, uh, Ben Canute, and who was second? Someone who was second, yeah. I can't even remember. Uh, Lionel Sanders. And that, that was this time last year, mate. So you're correct. I have, in fact, been correct <laughs> twice. <laughs> twice in a calendar year. Yeah, so, I mean, mate, it's, it's, always, it's always a welcome sight on this podcast when one of us gets something right. It's preferable when it's me. But, you know, I'm pleased that, uh, I'm pleased that out of the both of us, we, were, we discussed it last week. And we were, we were both, you know, we didn't just go with the whole the narrative that the Norwegian every race the Norwegians in they're going to win because that's a narrative they they are looking to exploit within the sport. But we and, won't let them, James Bell. We won't let them. We won't let them. And you know what else we won't do? We won't forget to say that this podcast is the official podcast of MX Endurance, the world's premier endurance sports community, created by four-time world champion Chris McCormack. James, what's something you like about MX Endurance, mate? Well, we've got to go back to the. Um, go back to the standard camp chat haven't we because it is hotting up the year is progressing nicely and we are heading head first towards utah in at the very end of may end of april and the very start of may we're going to be doing that camp leading up to the world championships with all kinds of lovely training and riding through those red canyons lots and lots of access to all the live podcast recordings and then um, a group watching the race with some cold beers and some uh, you know fun times I can confirm that I got the website finally set up so you can now sign up for the camp if you like. There will be a link in the show notes or below in YouTube. So if you want to come and join us, we have two options. We have the option with training and we have the option without training. So whatever is right for you, come, get involved, hang out. It'll be a great week. I'm really excited about it. Uh, It's funny how, James, now that I've been to Norway and back, like I've ripped that travel Band-Aid. So now I'm not that worried about traveling anymore. I'm like, yeah, travel's back to normal. So I'm super pumped to get back over to the US and uh, yeah, do a, do a good solid training week, man. I'll be bringing the probably the new speed concept over there, so everybody like looks turns their head as I ride past my beautiful new blue bike. But it's good times, mate. Good times, James Bale. And you know what? Yeah, other yeah. good times are happening. Yeah, I, 
Well, I just want to say, I, I, your nice blue speed concept will be lovely, but it will be overshadowed by my newly built S Works um, S Works TT bike. Are you going to bring that one? I the, the first time you ride, it's going to be in St George. Eh? What could go wrong? Yeah, yeah. What could go going wrong? up? Going up. So that what's the climb? Is it snow mountain, snow valley, death mountain, something, whatever yeah, it is. I, the... I'll take on any mountain with any descriptor. You Tell me you've it. got a one by on it. Tell me it's a one by, so you don't even have a small chain ring. <laughs> what could go wrong? James Bale, this weekend we have a big race coming up that we're going to start with, and that is Clash Miami 2022. Last year we saw the inaugural Clash of Miami take place in Miami. Imagine that. And you got you put this in here for me. It's Try 24-7 John Levinson. No, I put this in actually. Why am I blaming you? you I did the work. Try 24-7 John Levinson. He says, this weekend starts a day early if you're a triathlon fan with the second edition of Clash Miami, a $50,000 prize purse, and a good mix of long course, middle, and short course athletes going head-to-head. The event will be streamed live and for free on the Clash Endurance Facebook page. The distances, James, are 1.7 kilometer swim or 1.5 mile, 1.05 mile, a 62.7 bike, kilometer bike or 39 mile bike, and a 16.9 kilometer run or 10.5 mile run. Now, it's probably worth saying that's two laps of the swim, 17 laps of the bike plus a little bit, and seven laps of the run because yes james bell this is happening inside a racetrack like clash daytona we saw that they've got big plans for this series and let's talk about who's racing on the women the top ranked athlete based on ptf rankings is great britain's emma pallant brown who's ranked sixth we also have sarah perez sala last year she swam with lucy charles barclay and then led on the bike before eventually finishing fourth Pam- pamela Oliveira is another fish in the water so don't be surprised if that duo, duo are able to work together and potentially put close to two minutes into most of the field before arriving in T1. Chelsea Sodaro, uh, who made an impressive return to racing at, uh, for Team USA at the Collins Cup last year after giving birth. Uh, she was also recently training in Lanzarote with Kat Matthews uh, on their BMC team camp. So it's going to be interesting to see what Chelsea does. Uh, and she also was fourth at the Ironman 70.3 World Championships in 2019. So she's absolutely a class act. Uh, and the one that I'm very interested to see, James, is Ashley Gentle. We discussed that at the start of the year that she's now focusing entirely on middle and long course racing, and I think she is going to absolutely smash this race on the weekend. That's my prediction. Uh, what do you think about the women's race, mate? Yeah, man. I mean, as you know, uh, we're both excited to see Ashley Gentle stuff up into the um, seventy point three realm, and, and what she's capable of is yet to be seen. But we think well, she has won thing. some seventy point threes before, by the way. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, at this race this weekend. So what she's capable of around Miami, around that speedway in this environment is yet to be seen. But um, as you know, man, I'm a big fan of Eva Pallant Brown at the 70.3 distance. So I, I'm, I'm gonna put my money behind Emma because I think she's gonna, um, you know, shine brightly this weekend. It's interesting that one of the things that we all know about Ash Gentle is that the only weakness she really has is the swim, and we've got those two, um, Sarah, Sarah Perez Sala and Pamela Oliveira, who we know are very good swimmers in this race. Uh, yeah. But we, as we said last year, we saw that was it, it was Sarah Perez Sala who faded. Emma Pallant Brown, however, though, is an incredible runner, as is Ashley Gentle. So I think if there's an athlete who could probably, you know, test her or who's going to give us a good um, race between, I mean, Chelsea Zadaro was incredible running at the uh, Collins Cup as well. But yeah, mate, I'm I'm Ashley Gentle. Uh, it's nice to have an Australian that I can really really cheer for at these races. And uh, it's it's Team GB versus team au mate and looks at this so you can you can have emma pallant brown as your pick and i'll stick with ash general and we'll see we'll see if the the triathlon master is correct or the sexiest voice in triathlon is correct next week Are you, we? you're really going for this triathlon master thing aren't i'm you? just going to inception our audience <laughs> <Yeah>. uh <laughs> nostradamus maybe or i don't know he's like an old guy i don't want to be responsible when bad things happen uh the men's race however mate uh has a huge field. Like the men's field is honestly double the size based on, uh, I couldn't recognize three quarters of the name if I'm honest. Uh, but we'll go back to try 24 seven. First name on the extensive list is Sam Long, which reflects his current PTO ranking of number four. The big unit consistently pr- proved that he is more than yo, yo, yo hype during 2021 uh, highlighted by his silver medal behind Gustav Wien at the 70.3 world championships. Uh, ben Canute is the highest placed return and finisher from last year where he, a late kick on the run allowed him to complete the podium alongside Fredino and Sanders. Another name to watch is Sam Appleton, who recently won Geelong 70.3. There's also no shortage of bike power with Magnus Ditlev and Andrew Starkwicks lining up. They both 
outpaced Frodeno on two wheels last year, and for Ditlev in particular, he has continued to make rapid progress and has had several race wins since then, uh, plus a top 10 finish at 70.3 World Championships. Unfortunately, no yellow gains due to injury, but we know that Aaron Royal will arrive with a smile having just collected $100,000 at the Couples Championship, and other short course names are Jonas Schomburg and Matthew Sharp. Mate, this men's race is looking pretty good. Yeah, man. I mean, there's some bike power, isn't there? We'll be mention- We'll be touching on that a bit later, but there is some bike power in this race. And if it comes down to, you know, testing bike legs against bike legs, then, you know, I'm I'm putting Magnus Ditlev at the top of my list, who I think is going to have a good race this weekend. And, and I think that he's gone from strength to strength, looking at the end of his last year, the way his run has improved and the way that he's showing he can run off the bike. I'm... Uh, I'm putting my money behind Magnus for this one, bro. What do you think about Jonas Schomburg and Matt Sharp, about those those guys stepping up? Because Jonas Schomburg, we've seen, is a very good swim biker, and he often fades on the run in, in, in short course. But we know that short course, and this this is probably closer to Olympic distance race compared to, you know, like, I mean, I know Sam came second at 70.3 worlds, and, and Magnus is a 70.3 specialist. But this is, you know, closer to that Olympic distance sort of race. And so do you think we could see those ITU guys step up or you reckon it's going to be Magnus? I I mean, look, there's a complexity to this answer. Jonas Schomburg is no thought short and has no shortage of enthusiasm, does he? You know, he he's he's a very, you know, he's often off the front on the bike and then he'll go like hell at the first start of the run and get caught. Now, yep. Matt Sharp, he's a he's a great athlete and a really nice bloke. He's someone that I've I've spent time with and and enjoy the company of. I can't see these two making much of a dent on this race. If you know, if you're asking me whether it's going to be those two or Ditlev, I would say the question is is more, you know, if it's not going to be Ditlev then I'm looking towards someone like Sam Long or Ben Canute or someone along those lines to, you know, the quality I think in this race is in the existing 70.3 athletes and not the short course athletes that are coming to join them. Okay, interesting. Interesting. What are your thoughts on that? I would tend to agree with you. I, th- I, I'm looking at this one name that I would probably put in there who I think could uh, mix things up is Aaron Royal, who is you know he went to the Olympics for Australia last year, but he's I think very much a seventy point three athlete now. Uh, he's one that I I would be interested to see. But I my guts, Magnus. I mean, I think Magnus has really shone this year, and I think that that bike power on this sort of course is going to do him really really well. Uh, Starkey will be up there on the bike and then he'll fade you know, maybe out of the top 10 on the run. Sam Appleton was really good in Geelong. I think Sam's another one who I could see in the podium. Ben Canute, again, just a class act, all-round great athlete. And Sam Long also, you know, really showed his pedigree at that at that 70.3 Worlds. And we know that he was really motivated by what we saw Christian and uh, Gustav do at those late-year Ironman races. So it's going to be interesting to see where these guys are at, which ones are, you know, some people have probably given this a lot of attention, others maybe not so much. But I think what we need to do, James, just based on what happened last year, is I think we need to pick podiums, mate, not just the winners. I think we need to pick a one. Uh, we don't need to go in order, but we can pick the podium numbers. So three for the men, three for the women. What do you reckon? Yeah, yeah. All right, then. Um, Ditlev, Long, Canute. It's a good shout. It's a good shout. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Ditlev, Canute, Royal. Royal. In fact, no. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Ditlev, Royal, Long. Interesting. There we okay. go. It's a real Women? shame that there's no yellow gains there. Yeah, I, I think yellow gains would have. I think yellow gains would have wiped the floor with everybody if he was there. To be honest. Yeah. Um, uh, women's podium: uh, Pallant Brown, Ashley Gentle, and Perez Sala. I'm going to go Pallant Brown, uh, Oliveira. No, I'm going to go Sadaro. Sadaro, Gentle, Pallant. Did we just pick the same one? No. Okay. Good. Phew. That would have been awkward. There you go. I'm looking forward to this race. And again, worth noting, it's uh, free, free to watch. Free to watch and it will be streamed. Yeah. So um, you don't have to pay for it. And uh, hopefully the coverage will be of a high quality, which, you know, which is what we should come to expect in the sport, especially if someone's going to charge you for it. Imagine that, mate. Well, let's let's talk about races that are getting charged. And that is the couples championship, which happened over the weekend. Now, James, I saw that... uh, Listener and friend of the podcast, Karen, who actually went to the Couples Championship, said that we were a bit were a bit harsh on the Couples Championship last week, James Bale. Do you think after after the race has now happened, 
Do you think that your your attitude towards it has changed before we get into the? Uh, the uh, I'd like. Well, I'd, I'd certainly. I'd like. I think we should comment on the post that was put by Karen in the Facebook group because, yeah, I mean, look, we're looking at it from a from a pro athlete perspective and from a broadcast perspective and what what it is bringing for the sport from the from the perspective of people that were there on the ground and involved and and having fun and you know were part of the experience you know have at it that's brilliant and i love that and that's what the sport's about on a participation level we were looking at it from a what it was it going to bring to triathlon did it bring anything to triathlon have i seen anybody who watched the broadcast let's find out going on let's and on out. about how good it was um no and um look in my save mind, it. save yeah, it. Right. We'll do it afterwards. We'll go through the review and then you and then you can unleash because I know you're ready to unleash on this. Uh, I got this from Jonathan Turner at Try Twenty Four Seven. Uh, Britain's non Stanford and Australia's Aaron Royal claimed the hundred thousand dollar first prize by winning the inaugural couples championship in Florida on Sunday. The race, the brainchild of Ben Atkins of sponsors Waterfall Bank, played out on Facebook Watch via a pay per view stream, and the lack of live timing made things difficult for commentators, fans and journalists alike. Sharp and Royal were first out of the water along with Eric Lagerstrom, while the chasing pack were around 40 seconds off the pace in choppy waters. Rosanka Slupek and Rachel Klammer were the first women into T1. Royal took control early on the bike to open up a healthy gap and was 40 seconds ahead of Sharp when they arrived in T2. Lagerstrom and Tim O'Donnell were just behind. Klammer was the first woman into T2 just over five minutes off the pace with Slupek a minute further back. Royal continued to lead the way on the run and he would hand over to Stanford with the clock just past 51 seconds. Mignon handing over to Pierre and Sharp handing over to Casper were close behind. Casper would take over during the bike at the front and she headed into T2 with a 12 second lead over Stanford. Finlay was around 45 seconds off pace and Pierre was a minute 20 back. At this stage, the first man, Seth Ryder, was five minutes off the pace just ahead of Richard Murray. Now it was a question of who would prevail on the run. Stanford or Casper. With $100,000 on the line, it was Non who proved the stronger, putting in a terrific performance to pass her rival and surge clear to claim the bumper paycheck. So the results of the 0.25-mile swim, 10-mile bike, and 3.1-mile run are Aaron Royal and Non Stanford in first, Matt Sharp and Kristen Casper in second, Clement Mignon and Marjolaine Pierre in third place, Eric Lagerstrom, Paula Finlay in fourth, Justin Metzler, Jeannie Metzler fifth, Rosanne Kaslupek and Seth Ryder, 6th. Sam Osborne, Samantha Kingswood, 7th. Rachel Klammer and Richard Murray, 8th. That's not right, is it? Because Tim O'Donnell and um, Miranda Carfrey were in there too. So I don't know where they're – I don't know what happened there. Interesting. Anyway, James Bell. Yeah, yeah, look. Um, there's been a lot of chat on this on, about this online and various people did or didn't enjoy it. Um, there are various opinions on what it did for triathlon. Now – in my mind, they they charge nine ninety nine over here to watch the race, um, and not many people watched it. Now, if you're going to do something like this, surely the objective is if you're looking to grow the sport, um, which is the stated objective, is to bring new eyes to it. And I will argue that no new eyes were brought to this because of the charge, and also because of the quality of the broadcast being, you know, rubbish terrible none of those existing eyes are going to come back and watch it again so it's going to be a flash in the pan now ultimately in my mind they're going after their loyal fan base for a big lump of money to provide something that is rubbish to watch and then a payday for the professional athletes that were there that's not doing anything for that existing loyal fan base other than pissing them off and it's just not, I don't see it as something that's going to garner any momentum or enthusiasm. And I mean, it sounds a bit extreme, but essentially you're defrauding your fans because if they tune in and see the incredibly rubbish broadcast that was put out there for this race, where you can't see what's going on, you don't know what the splits are, you don't know who's winning and you're just going to, but then you see the, those pros that won or lost getting a prize purse and you're like, well, that's where my money went. Yeah, I, I, there's a few things I want to say about this because we, like, some people thought we were joking. I genuinely forgot this race was happening last week. I, I, I hand on my heart, that was true. Like, until I think I saw Emma Palin Brown posting about she was on her way to America for it, I was like, oh, I'd, I'd completely forgotten about it. And I am a tragic mate. I love triathlon, I love watching triathlon, 
And at no point was I interested in paying them and not because of them. I just wasn't interested in the concept. I mean, I've read that report and it actually sounds like maybe that, that women's race was, was kind of good, but everything I heard online was that the broadcast was unwatchable, like actually unwatchable. And the thing, I, I, I think you're right. Like I heard, I heard that there was only about 500 people who watched it. So it's not like it's, you know, what, let's say, what's that? $5,000, like $5,000 of revenue. Is that right? Anyway, mm. like not, not anything. You compare that to an Ironman event, which is free to stream and you can see their numbers on their Facebook now, whatever you want to call it. And they'll get 50,000 people at any one time on it. Again, we're not talking huge numbers, but you know, overall there's lots of eyeballs on it compared to, to 500. And like I said, apparently the commentators didn't know what was happening. They had no times. It was just random drone shots of the sky, not even actually showing anything. I saw uh, Brad Colt put up a screenshot. And it was literally just of a hedge with the runners were actually on the other side of the hedge. Uh, I'm really glad that I didn't, didn't partake in it. And the thing I find weird about it, and it maybe it's a stroke of genius, to be honest, is this waterfall bank. Like as much as he's come out and said that he's hurt, he thinks that triathletes are impoverished and he's doing, it's not charity there's a purpose for this and that's that waterfall bank want to get their brand out there. Fuck me, mate. I've heard of waterfall bank now, not necessarily yeah. for the right reasons, but maybe there is some method to his madness where the, the controversy or the discussion of whether this is right or wrong is doing them a, a lot of good. I don't think, I, I think this is going to be another one of those brands that we see come into the sport and will be gone in a year or two, because if you've put up a hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, for the prize of first place plus all the other prizes, and you get 500 people paying for your PPV, and most people have forgotten the race was even happening. Like it's a very, it's a very easy way to measure ROI and go, yeah, that's not working. Like that's no. not, that is not a good investment. I, I said this to you. We, we've discussed this a fair bit this week offline, and I still, to me, I, I think that there's something about you said it to Martin in the interview, but like. There's something to this format. I think there is something to it. I just don't think it needs to be couples. No. But to me, it would have made more sense to see Waterfall if they if they genuinely want to bring people to triathlon support. Why didn't they go and support the PTO tour? Why isn't the the US the PTO tour in the US called the Waterfall Bank PTO US tour? Like to me, that would have been and then bolster the prize purse there. That to me would have made more sense because it's sort of working with somebody who's also trying to support and grow the sport rather than like sort of this, this constant like fragmentation thing. And you get these athletes who are like, I, I, we expected Richard Murray and Rachel Clammer to go there and win it because they to me were the best two athletes. They were last mate. And then they're saying, Oh, we weren't really fit. It's like, well, you got paid to go to this thing. And you got like, I, there's too many of these races that pop up that pe it's like the pro see them as novelty races. And they just sort of go for a payday, have a bit of a go don't take it serious. And that doesn't help move the sport forward. No. Like you said, I can't, I can't see any, I can't see any outcome of this. Again, the people on the ground, it sounded like they had a fantastic time. I know that the MX guys who were there loved it. I know how great it is to go to this sort of events, especially if it's a small group, you get, you know, access to all these people. And there, and there was money raised for charity, there. which is a good thing. Yeah. So you that's know, worth $30,000. That yeah. We've got to add that as a good thing they did, but are we a pro sport or aren't we? Is it yeah. just purse rich, rich business? person at the top of rich business starts doing triathlon thinks oh you know what i'd like to do meet some pro triathletes i'll put on a shoddy race and charge people to watch it and um you know jobs are good and then they'll see there's no return on investment because they haven't done a very good job there wasn't a very good broadcast no one watched the damn thing no one cares and then they fade away from the sport and this is a flash in the pan make something more sustainable put some fucking effort in lower the prize money so it's because again a hundred thousand dollars is a big jump to what most we saw dubai was fifteen thousand dollars yeah. You don't need I understand the way I look at this. But man, half it. Make that for yeah. put fifty thousand dollars extra into the broadcast to make those people who did pay for it get something better yeah, than what and, they got. Like, make it make it a, a, a men's and women's uh race, which you don't have to be couples. If you're a couple, fair play. If you're not, you're not. Yeah. And then make it optional. reduce reduce the prize money slightly, put that money into the broadcast and pay some appearance fees. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, the other thing that I was, I was thinking about like this, this whole concept is, and I don't want to be critical of it because I, I'm getting a bit sick of this narrative of poor pro triathletes like this. 
oh, these poor pro triathletes, just it's so hard for them to make an income. And I love pro triathlon and I want the bet I want the people in a sport who are fantastic to be able to comfortably live. I want them to be able to set themselves up for that. I want it. But it's it's it feels too much like a donation or charity to me. This this oh they just like the I love what the PTO did during the pandemic, but it was just this narrative of like we're just we're propping up the sport. We're propping up the sport, we're helping them, we're helping them, we're helping them. There has to be a reason why there's no money in the sport. And instead of putting band-aids over it by just giving out chunks of money. Let's get to the cause of it because I think yeah. I think we know what the cause is at the moment. The cause is it's unbroadcastable and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing these the Super League. We're seeing what the PTO is trying to do. So this just feels like a fundamental misfire for me when it's like we know what the problem is, but no, we're not. Go- it Honestly, from what I heard was like they had one camera, a drone. It, it's, it, I don't get it, mate. Like that's why I just don't – it's like was this actually just – a money laundering thing like oh was it just like i just want to give the pros some more money i I don't and again if he it's his money if that's what this guy wants to do great like fantastic again i'm really happy that those pro um, athletes i would suggest the money. if he's got if he's if you want to create an sponsor entity the PTO. You know, sponsor some athletes man if you're that desperate have, to he, he has done that like he has some of the athletes are now sponsored i saw that um uh heather jackson's they're her bike sponsor now. So she's not sponsored by a bike rent. Waterfall Bank are all over her bike. Like they're, they're, they're doing good stuff. And as you said, they donate a lot of money. I just don't get this, mate. It just feels, yeah, I don't know. It feels odd. It feels odd. That's all. Yeah, and, it feels tacky. And again, like the, rep- the, the, the the replies and the comments and everything I saw online were very much like I, I had low expectations and I was still disappointed. Worst yeah. $10 I ever spent. Like, it was, it, I didn't really, in fact, I saw one person who was, I think they put up a post saying like, if, if you're not watching this, you're missing out. And then somebody said, broadcast is terrible. And they're like, yeah, broadcast wasn't good. Da, 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 da. Oh, but they will be better next year. Like stop giving these guys free passes. Like mm. the Collins cup, we gave a free pass to, but they put effort in. You could see what they were going for. This honestly felt like one of those Ironman live trackers where they have a few, a few cameras but they're charging you like a lot of money, not a lot of money, but they're charging you money. It's it's it, it just doesn't it doesn't make sense in my head, mate. I think is is where I'm at. Hey, so ten ninety nine, nine ninety nine is not an inconsiderable, in, yeah. not is not a tiny amount of money when you're talking about a race that lasts for a certain amount of time. It's like you know, I would I would hesitate to pay nine ninety nine to watch a Formula One race. Well, here's the thing: if you are, let's say you're a, a triathlon fan who's you know, there, there's a few races we've they've, like. I think it was Clash last year. You had to pay for, and you've gone. Nah, I'm not going to do it. But you heard it was great, and then you were a bit confused about how the Collins Cup or Challenge Daytona was working, and you weren't quite sure. So you've been on the fence about paying for racing. And you thought, I, I keep hearing about how great these races are on the MX Endurance podcast. I'm going in on the PPV. I want to support the sport. I'm going to do it. I put my 10, 10 bucks US down to watch this race, and then you get an absolutely terrible broadcast. You're not going to pay for another PPV, mate, are you? You're going to go. I've been burnt, and that, and then those races that are worth it, this person's not going to pay for, and that again doesn't help prop up the sport, doesn't help grow the sport, doesn't no. help create alternative revenue streams. It, it takes like it back a step. Twenty five pound a year for my Eurosport um, yeah. subscription, which covers all pro cycling, Tour de France, Giro d'Italia, Vuelta España, all the classics, World Championships. You know, nine ninety nine for one shitty broadcast of a couples championship. I don't give a shit about. Nah, never going to happen. I feel like we've uh, roasted the- again. I, I great great work by the guys who won it, Aaron Royal and and uh, Non Stefan. I know they've got a wedding coming up, so that that'll help. Uh, which again is good, but yeah, I just I just wonder how many more of these races we're going to see. To be honest, like I can't see it happening again. But maybe it'll happen again, and I don't know, mate. Maybe they learn the. I hope they learn the lessons, and we come back, and it's great next year. I hope that it's not about couples. I hope that it is just mixed mixed real. I think that'd be a better idea, but we'll see. We'll see. Let's move on. Let's move on. Move on. Let's get on to our big topic this week because, as people know, we've uh, got Martin Van Riel, the the winner of Ironman Dubai seventy point three, and now the new Ironman seventy point three world record holder. I got this from Romy Louise Van Schoenveld from Try Today, and that says Martin Van Riel's world record Ironman seventy point three has been officially recognised. Martin Van Riel pulled off an amazing race last Saturday as he ran towards the win of Ironman 70.3 Dubai. He finished in 3.26.06. 
While that first turned out to be just under a minute too slow for setting a new work world record, Ironman later decided to officially recognize the world record. The world record had previously in the, was previously in the hands of Olympic champion Christian Blumenfeld. However, the bike course during the race where he set that record, Bahrain 70.3 2019, was a few kilometers too short, which makes Van Riel's time actually faster. While Van Riel already claimed the world record a little himself, Ironman has now confirmed the record. We were a bit confused about this ourselves, Jimbo, but yeah, it sounds like we know why. We were a little bit. It was because of like, um, you know, we, that, we discussed this with Martin in the interview, so I don't think we should uh, go over we'll it again. It but you'll, you'll find out in the interview what the actual dynamics behind that world record being awarded are. And uh, what should we do? Should we just um, quickly skim through the results and then uh, head over to the interview? I think I would like to talk about the results a little bit, especially the women's race. I think is I have I have some things that I'd like to discuss about that, and then we'll drop the interview in after that. So right, let's do let's do the women's race first, then. So read off the results, and then we'll have a chat. Okay, so in first place, you had Laura Phillip from Germany in three fifty three oh three, also a new seventy point three world record or world best. Second place, Daniel Arif three fifty six fifty five. Third place, Lottie Lucas four oh seven oh. Three. Now the ring. The thing I wanted to talk about, James, is we were, we were saying this is going to be a big. Where's Daniela Reef at? After this performance, James, where's Daniela Reef at? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, three fifty two behind um, Laura Phillip, and I would just like to point out. I point. I picked Laura Phillip for the win on this one, and correct. I was I was correct. Um, where is Daniela Reef at? It's difficult to say. It is anything it? other than she's not where I think she should be mm. or where I expected her to be. Now, look, it's an early, early race in the season. Um, but normally uh, under normal service previous to COVID and all that, you would expect Daniela Reef to just be, you know, ticking this off, chalking it up. Jobs are good. And, and this is concerning for me in terms of where she is and, and what uh, what's going to happen for the rest of the year. What's your answer to Wes Daniela Reef, Tim Ford? Same, mate. I, I the thing I think shocked me the most was the drop off on her run pace. In the, like she started pretty good, and then there was a like a quite a drop off in her pace. I mean, Laura Phillip, mate. She is talk about make it like I don't think anybody was talking about Laura Phillip twelve months ago. We, it was all about Lucy Charles and and Daniela Reef. I think I read somewhere that this result will probably push Laura Phillip to world number one on the PTO rankings because of the, the way the points work. Mate, she is she is an athlete that we have to pay attention to at literally every major event this year. St. George, Kona, 70.3 worlds, the PTO events if she wants to do them. Like, what a performance, mate. She ran minutes into Daniela Reef. But yeah, I'm I'm wondering whether we're gonna see Daniela Reef maybe make that transition to just Iron Man. Or she's going to give it up. I, I can't see Daniela Arif hanging around if she's just middle in performances, not not winning the way she is. If that's what's going to keep happening, I think we'll see her just retire or we'll see her focus a lot more on, on Ironman and, and dominate, which is my my preference, I hope. I mean, I just hope she she improves and gets back to where we're used to her seeing. But again, Matt, I, I just I wonder where the motivation comes from these days considering she's won everything in long yeah. course racing. So. Yeah, that that is that is the question, isn't it? Where that motivation comes from, what her objective now is, because she was she was untouchable, and um, oh yeah, well done to Laura Phillip. What a result! What a great achievement to get that world best, and uh, really happy to see that. But be interesting to you know monitor Daniela now and see where she goes from here and what she decides to do, because um, you know. All good things come to an end, mate, and uh, how they come to an end is often the interesting discussion in a pro sports person's life. Interesting little just tidbit, just because we talked about Danielle, and I always think of Danielle and Jan in a you know the same sort of sentence. I've heard rumors that Jan Fredino might be at Oceanside seventy point three. I've also heard these rumors. Yeah, I've heard rumors so... that there's one hell of a stacked field at Oceanside seventy point three. So we'll see. We'll keep a watching brief on that, shall we? And it's interesting that we've both heard the rumors from different people where normally we we share the rumors with each other, but that's, this is an independent rumor. Yeah. Uh, to the men's race, we're just going to fly through the results and then we'll drop in an interview with the winner. First place, Martin Van Riel in a world record time of 3.26.06. He rode a 1.53. I still can't believe that. Second place, Daniel Beckergaard from Denmark, 3.27.54, who was over a minute faster than his time last year. And in third place, Pierre Lacour, 3.33.01. 
one. Uh, in tenth place, I should also mention we had Christian Bloomfeld in three forty nine oh seven. Paul Christian's had mechanicals at his last two seventy point three races, mate. He had that at seventy point three worlds, and then he had it at this one. So it's uh, not having a good time at the seventy point three races. I also saw just before we get into it, uh, Ian Farrell, MX member Ian Farrell, had took a, took a photo of Christian's front wheel uh, in transition, and on the tire it had sample A written on the tire. And Ian was wondering whether Christian's testing equipment for sub seven. And I thought that was a pretty interesting um, observation. Nice little insight there, mate. Eh? Well picked up. Love it. Exactly. Well, look, let's drop in the interview with Martin and we'll be back afterwards. Yeah, so this week we welcome Martin Van Riel to the podcast, a professional triathlete from Belgium who came second at the 2021 World Triathlon Championship Series and in within that, he got a second place at, at WTCS, the grand final in Edmonton, third place at the WTCS Leeds and WTCS Montreal. And this weekend, he's gone and won the 70.3 in Dubai in 3.26.06, beating Daniel Beckergaard into second place and Christian Blumenfeld into 10th place. Martin, how are you, mate? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for having me on the podcast. It's been a, a, great, a great week already. So, uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. How are the legs, bro? I noticed... oh. How are the legs? How are you feeling? How's your recovery? Actually, not too bad. Uh, I think only on, on Sunday, so the day after the race, that's when I felt pretty pretty terrible uh, because, yeah, we wanted to, to celebrate a little bit, see a little bit of Dubai, but then uh, as, a, as a triathlete, you also have to pack uh, uh, 20 bags as well to, to travel home. So, uh, travel home on Sunday morning. And after that, I was actually really smashed, but Monday it was out of the system. It's the, the great weekly reset on Sunday night, I guess. Last time you're on the show, mate, you just won the super league triathlon arena games. And now we've got you on after winning a, your second 70.3. I know that I got in a lot of trouble when I said you were making your debut last year. Uh, lots of your fans were, were tweeting at me, no idiot, he's already raced and won one before. Uh, bit of a difference in distances. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's probably the, the, the widest you can go on the spectrum. And uh, I'm actually, the, my next race is going to be the arena games again. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back on the, on the very shortest of distances. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think the thing they they have in common is that uh, these kinds of of uh, races you can't have any weakness, uh, and that's 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 a bit my strength. So uh, that's why they both uh, fit me. So you're gonna win the arena games then? <laughs> I, I didn't say that, huh? but uh, I'm I'm for sure gonna try. I mean, I'm the I'm the defending champion, and this year there is a uh, a lot more on the line because there is the world title now as well. So I hope it's going to be uh, all a little bit bigger as well. And, and there will be big names on the starting line that, that will all want to grab that title. But uh, I'm for sure going to go for it. So Dubai 70.3, mate. Talk us through it. How did it go? What was it like from your perspective? Yeah, it was it was really good. Um, like the the starting with the preparation that I was a lot more prepared than last time, like knowing what i trained and prepared and um and and worked on now like nutrition aerodynamics and and all the little things i actually have no clue how i won already the other <laughs> 70.3 <laughs> because yeah i i literally just basically signed up bought my tickets to to china last time and and went on to uh to win that race but um yeah this time i was a lot more prepared um Although in race week, a lot went wrong as well. Um, what went but, wrong? Uh, Talk us through it, mate. What happened? <laughs> it's a little bit embarrassing, but uh, I Excellent. ended up at the airport and I had some uh, some uh, some training partners, some friends staying at my apartment here in Girona. Uh, so me and my coach, we drove to the airport and I arrived there and I get a phone call from the guy that was in my apartment. Like, mate, like your race suit is here. Do you, do you have to? <laughs> And I'm like, oh no, like, no, I don't have two. <laughs> and I, I, I literally couldn't believe it. But yeah, like long distance race suit is, is probably the most important thing. Like, I mean, my sponsors would not be happy if I would have raced yeah. in a, a blanked out kit or something like that. So, um, so yeah, I, I had to postpone my flight actually for that. Like oh, well. I flew a day, <laughs> I flew a day later. Luckily I didn't have to, uh, to pay any, any extra fees. Um, 
but yeah, that was that was that was a bad start of the week, and then uh, yeah, some some tubeless problems as well. I, I tried to do my own tubeless tire, and it was uh, letting off some uh, some of the sealant. So, so you're that covered was awesome. in it all over you. It's a nightmare. <laughs> pretty isn't much, it? pretty much. <laughs> it was not during the race, like before I fixed it. But uh, I can say you like that was the. I really enjoyed Dubai, but the bad thing is it's really hard to navigate, and it's a huge city. Like it's huge. Like yeah, so uh, that gave me a little bit of stress in race week, but in the end, it was all okay. To race day though, gun goes off. What are you thinking about just before the start? I mean, we're going into this race and all the talk really was um, Christian Blumenfeld and Daniel Beckengard. Did that, was that on your mind? Were you thinking, no, no, you're, you're talking about the wrong people, guys, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, for sure I believed that I could, uh, could jump myself in between them but uh on the other hand like i i know that these guys have a way bigger uh, resume on the on the long distance so i don't think i don't feel like i was left out of that conversation i think it's kind of normal that they maybe uh didn't didn't know me that well yet on the long distance um and and yeah i i kind of liked it because um it's only my second 70.3 so i didn't want to say too much like oh like i I'm a favorite as well. Uh, I just wanted to try and, and, and catch them all by surprise. Uh, but I think Daniel, uh, who I know, who I know quite well, and, and Christian, I know him quite well as well. So, like, I think they knew that I was probably gonna gonna be in shape if I was on the starting line. So, um, so yeah, it was more the, the outside world that that uh, that didn't maybe expect it. But uh, yeah, it was fun to battle with these guys. So. Not all the uh, not all the outside world wasn't paying attention because one of the hosts of this podcast picked you for the win. Actually, I'm not going to say who it was, uh, but I think from the person who said you can probably have a guess which one was which one made the pick that you would win, and uh, is very happy that you did win. Uh, but yeah, like how was the actual performance? What what was it like out there? How did how did you feel during the day? What was going through your head at different points during the race? Yeah, I, I think I felt really good from the start and, and I was kind of in control the whole time. Um, on the swim, we got away with, uh, with a little group. We had some of the, the ITU guys there, some really fast swimmers like Salvisberg and Pierre Lacour. Um, yeah, Pierre Lacour. Also, Bakagard is an incredible swimmer. And when I was looking back and I saw five guys, well, I saw four guys, but we were five. Um, I was thinking like Christian's, Christian's there because... Yeah, I named these three guys and then there was one more. So I was like, ah, damn it. Then I tried to speed up the last part of the swim. But then, uh, yeah, I was pretty surprised that he wasn't there. But I think uh, I, I saw that he tripped on the beach. Like he kind of had a, had a little tumble at, at the start. So that might have been why he wasn't uh, attached to our group um, from the start of the swim. Uh, but yeah, so the swim was, was quite in control. And then on the bike um basically i just started full gas because i saw like well christian's not there and um i thought he was for sure gonna be the the toughest competitor to beat i mean he was the 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 uh, favorite by far um so yes i started really drilling the bike and basically after like 15k it was only back that uh, was still there and he was happy to uh, to to work together actually, um, so that was really good. But uh, yeah, it was actually a little bit funny as well because um, both of us thought the other one was really pushing when he went to the front. So, uh, so I thought he was really pushing. pushing. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. So I, I, when I went to the front, I I thought I was kind of trying to slow down the pace a little bit, but he's like, what? <laughs> Mate, you were drilling in the front, and, and like I felt the same about him. So that that was kind of funny, but yeah, no, we worked perfectly together. So that was really great to to put the others on a disadvantage. So how hard how hard did he push you? You know, were you, that you was he was second place to you on when it came to the run. How hard how hard did you have to go to get that victory? So actually, on the I mean, I think he really pushed me hard on the bike because at one point I was really thinking like, what this these watts are too high. Like I'm, I'm going to have to let him go because otherwise I'm going to be uh, walking the run course. Um, but then actually 
on the run, I immediately got like a pretty big gap um, because I had like a really good transition. So that's my uh, my ITU uh, yeah. <laughs> my ITU experience, I guess. Um, so and I think in the first couple of kilometers, uh, Daniel also told me that he had some troubles with uh, with like his muscles uh, on at the end of the bike because yeah, it's a it's a course where you literally sit ninety k in the TT bars. Um, so I think he struggled the first couple K and yeah, basically after three, four K, it was a, almost a one minute difference. And then he actually stayed for the next 10 K. He pretty much stayed on pace, yeah. but yeah, a one minute lead. It's, it's quite comfortable if you, if you know, you're not going absolutely over your limit. So, uh, I was pretty confident, uh, from basically the start of the run. We've seen you have some some close races with Christian, uh, especially in Edmonton last year, where you know fantastic finish. One of the things we we when we're going to get to a bit later, but is is Christian sort of has this way of going about his racing where he sort of pushes to the end and then pushes even harder. D- did you think that when you saw like did you very much have that plan when you started to go to Daniel? Hey, we need to get away from this guy. Like is that is that you trying to take it to him? Like not not go no it's christian we can't beat him no go no we're not going to let him dictate the way the, the way this race happens yeah for sure for sure i mean in i actually tried the same in in that edmonton race like i i tried to i mean i know that uh that on the run he's probably gonna gonna take me on uh on like 75 percent of the days he's probably gonna win or or maybe even uh more but um yeah, maybe I'm a little bit, well, I'm a bit stronger in the swim. On the bike, I think we're probably, ah, in my opinion, we're quite equal, I think. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, I have to try and uh, make a difference off the bike. Um, and and that's that's for sure the plan. Like, if, if yeah, one of the biggest favorites is not there, you're going to try to capitalize on the moment immediately. And, uh, yeah, I think we perfectly did that. And I think Daniel also had to the faith in himself to uh to really go for it and and yeah he's he's a he's a really good competitor as well i think he's going gonna go do some great things this year your your friends and training partners in the lead up to this race i saw them saying uh i think we're going to see a new record look out you're gonna have to rewrite the record books i saw vince louis put out that comment what (laughs) is it that you were doing that made them all so confident that you were going to smash this race (laughs) <laughs> I, I think part of it was just them joking as well. I mean, we, we knew that it was a really fast course looking at results from the last years. But um, yeah, they were kind of uh, kind of um, teasing me a little bit with it as well. Um, uh, I think be- maybe because I mentioned it once. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I went on one, like it was a, a big session with Darren Royal. And th- there he was like, well, I made like... <laughs> That was pretty insane what what you just did in that session and then i was like i mean i, I actually felt pretty comfortable in that session it was like four times uh 25 minutes um between 330 and 340 watts um and yeah i think that's kind of how the how the joke played but you know, they, they were more teasing me, me me with it and uh um yeah that's, that's, so does that that's give you feel next time you see them being like you doubted me smart asses that's what i went and did like is, is that the is that the next is that the response <laughs> well yeah we, we, it was for sure fun to uh to, to then actually like actually do it well i don't know i still don't know 100 percent if i did it or not but uh but yeah that, that's for sure uh a fun a fun answer so um you and christian Blumenfeld, you had that finish in edmonton last year the brand of invincibility that the Norwegians are trying to create, you know, they're trying to sow doubt in everyone's minds that if if Christian or Gustav is on the start line, then, you know, everyone else is rec- racing for second place. Did beating him in Dubai, is that a bonus for you? And what do you think of that brand of invincibility they're trying to create? Where where does that sit in your head? Um, yeah, like I mean, I think uh, for sure that for sure having having done it now in this seventy point three g- gives me a lot of confidence for the future. But then, <laughs> then again, I'm uh, I'm probably not gonna do many seventy point threes at least this year. So um, I, I'm gonna have to build the confidence more in the short course racing, where uh, where um, I think for me Christian is is uh, even harder to beat um, for not leaving my profile. I mean, um, but yeah, for sure I. I I believe no one's invincible. Like I, I believe on 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 my best day, I can beat 
I can beat anyone. Um, although like I can also be, how you say, I can, I'm also very realistic. And, and in that way, people sometimes think that I don't believe in myself because I can literally, I, I can honestly just say like, uh, that Christian is going to beat me in, in, uh, maybe, maybe even 85% of the days, uh, when it comes down on the run. Um, but I do actually b- really believe that I can still beat him every time I'm, I'm on the starting line. So, um, so if he'd, yeah. if he'd, if he'd caught the feet in that swim and been with them on the bike, uh, do you, would you have had an extra gear to go to on the run? If he'd been there pushing you, do you think you could have gone faster? Yeah, I think I, I could have probably gone a, a little bit, a little bit faster. Um, I mean, there would have also been a very big likelihood of of me uh, or or hopefully him as well exploding uh on the run which now it was a lot easier because i could just like find my own pace which i was on the limit obviously by the end but um but it's more of a constant steady effort while if someone else is there i would have probably really pushed myself with the risk of of exploding yeah so um What's the balance between short course and 17.3 going forward through the year? Are you going to, you said a minute ago, you're not going to be doing a huge amount of 70.3s. Are you just going to flick over to short course focus for the next um, foreseeable for the season? Or do you, have you got any sort of 70.3 or even full distance plans in the future, mate? Uh, I mean, for sure there is plans, but um, yeah, I, I think. Whip out an Ironman Texas that- in, in April or something, you know. Why not? <laughs> no, that, that for sure not. <laughs> no, um, but um, yeah, the, there's plans for sure. But the problem is that this year, um, it seems like the, the calendar is very difficult already uh, for short course. Like it goes super, super long. So, um, and then, yeah, you have Super League. You have like, they're, they're still adding World Series to the calendar as well. So like, it's it's too busy. Like I can't even uh, put a race in now yet. I really hope to do one still after the grand final, if there is one. I, I heard Bahrain might be uh, mid mid December, so that might be an option. Um, but it's very hard to, for me to yeah really put uh, put a, a, a date and a race down already. Let's talk about world, world WTCS race in a little bit. Obviously, second second place last year, uh, all those podiums. Is the is is that you know what are you thinking for this year? What's the plan? What are you, what are your beliefs for this season? Like, do you think you can you can go to that next level up? Is this the year that we're going to see you on the top step of the podium? I mean, I, I hope so. I'm I'm really working hard for it, but um, yeah, like for sure, WTCS more than seventy point three. It's it's about the run. So I, <laughs> it's it's a fun quote that that some people were telling me after Olympics. It's actually true that. Uh, Short course racing, it's maybe a little bit more a running race for capable swimmers and bikers, um, <laughs> which I, <laughs> which it's, it's, that <laughs> that's a new one it's for kind me. Of, I, like, I yeah, like that. It's kind of true. <laughs> it's kind of true. Uh, so for sure, I have to step up, especially my, my running level, uh, another little step. I, I've, I've came really, really close uh, last year, but... Uh, yeah, that's the I, goal I, for this year. I'd just like to say you've rode a 153 in Dubai, and does that make you an okay, a capable biker? Like that's that's yeah, got to yeah. be one of the fastest 70 point. I actually I need to check. That's got to be one of the fastest bike splits ever in a 70.3, <laughs> that, and, and that's, that's cap- capable. What, what are you and I? Too, <laughs> no, but eh? but but no, no. That, that's actually not what I meant because I believe that I'm a strong biker, oh, good. especially <laughs> for I was, ITU. But <laughs> I was, I was <laughs> no, no, oh, Jesus. <laughs> No, but um, but I, I just mean that with that bike strength, like on Olympics, I think I actually had really good biking legs, but you can't uh, change the race completely by yourself. Yeah. And and I think that's the, the biggest difference. You don't, you, because it's a drafting race, you don't have uh, a huge impact alone. Um, so that's let's, why I said it. <laughs> let's talk about this a little bit because one of the things we see a lot and, and – both me and James, we, we, we follow the short course racing a lot. We, we really like it. And we hear a lot of uh, long course fans always say, uh, yeah, short co- the bike doesn't count. They're not that good on the bike. They're going to come to middle distance. They can't ride 90K TT. How hard is ITU, or sorry, World Triathlon bike riding? How, how tough is it in that group on the bike in a race? 
Yeah, it really depends on on the course as well. But uh, but I think there is in in general there is actually a really really high uh, bike level. Um, but it just doesn't play out in every every race. But in a race like like Edmonton, where it was some smaller groups racing against each other, I think uh, yeah, really <laughs> don't underestimate it. And uh, and and for many of the many of the biggest uh, well the main the main characters are maybe not the fastest runners, but it's just the combination of of having a really good bike leg um, that makes them. Yeah, run faster. Like Alex Yi is probably going to beat Christian any day on the track, but uh, still Christian uh, beats him often in triathlon. Well, what we need, what we need in WTCS racing is crosswinds and echelons, mate. That would that would put the cat amongst <laughs> the pigeons. That's what we want. Long flat stages with crosswinds. <laughs> Done. Yeah, that's true. Or or uh, or uh, like or category climbs, like really. Yeah, yeah. That would tough, be epic. Tough, eh? uh... <laughs> We touched on it, and this is something that we've been a little bit confused about, and, I, and you're probably in the dark a little bit too, but Dubai 70.3 is being called a world record. But we also know that Christian did a 325-21 in Bahrain in 2019. What's your understanding about the situation? with? And I, and I know you don't necessarily love the records because of the course differences, but has anybody explained this to you? Has anybody t- talked to you about this? Like, Do you know what's going on with it? Yeah, so so actually, uh, after the race, I talked with the the race organizer of Dubai, who is actually also the race organizer of Bahrain. It's uh, it's the same, um, and he told me that it was because um, it is actually officially mine is actually officially a world record because uh, congratulations. I think that I think they call it world best because um, because there is no official distance, but. The thing is, uh, the distance can't go more than two percent off um, of the yeah the ninety k, for instance, mm-hmm. um, which it was the case in Bahrain that year. Um, so actually, Christian's Bahrain of twenty eighteen that was the world record that was standing now. So it's okay. that's a, a three twenty nine. Um, but in twenty nineteen, there was apparently a, a very last minute roadworks going on in Bahrain uh, and they had to cut another 2k of the course which made it uh, 86 instead of 88 uh, and that's why yeah it, it didn't fall in that two percent uh, margin and that's why it's uh, it's actually not the official time that was the last triathlon I did 2019 Bahrain that was before Same. all before all this happened well, yeah Same. yeah I miss it but well, my gamma measured did- 88 so I don't know what that's about um did that did that record did, did chasing that record at any point come into your mind? You, when you had that lead over Daniel and you were looking at the watch and you knew that you'd given your mates a bit of grief or your mates were giving you a bit of grief about it, <laughs> was that record motivating you to go to push yourself at any point? No, actually not because I didn't I didn't have any idea. I mean, I knew I was going very fast because I saw, I saw 48.2 uh, kilometers an hour on my bike computer. But, <laughs> um, but I, I didn't measure the swim. Um, I had my bike computer for the bike and my run watch on the run. So like, you know, like I I didn't really put all the pieces together that I was actually having a really good time. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, I actually changed coaches a couple of months back and I think my coach was actually maybe more nervous than me. So I think he didn't uh, dare to really like, uh, say anything about it like about a time or like about world records or about world bests or whatever um so no i i only realized when i was 100 meters from the line and i saw there was a, a 325 on the clock still then uh, do that the numbers I was having interest a really you? really fast time do the numbers interest you? Do, you do you do you care about the the numbers and the times i mean are we going to see are we going to see mm. you in bahrain trying to get a 324 for example just to underline it I mean, is it is well, it relevant in your mind, or is it just the win that matters? May, maybe now a little bit uh, because there uh, <laughs> because of all the discussion, but uh, but no, uh, for me it's it's definitely the win because I I, I re- actually really don't like uh, times. Um, I think I think we should strive to uh, have great triathlon battles and not chase times um, because yeah. Also, this one, eh, Dubai, it's got, it's very hard to break a time like that on an actual 90k bike course because 
It's just the specific specificity of the wind there, which uh, it almost always picks up uh, during the, the, the race. So you have a headwind, but it's not super crazy headwind. And then on the way back, you have a tailwind and it's a quite solid tailwind. So yeah, you can't, really can't compare. And, and I prefer uh, crossing the finish line first than, uh, than any world record. You touched on the fact that you've changed coaches recently. Uh, it's something that I wanted to discuss with you because you were, you know, you've, you've, you you are, a, you know, a very high level athlete. What what's the process like for somebody like yourself changing coaches? Like, do you do you, do you go out there and and or do people approach you? Like, what what's that process like as a, you know, one of the you know number two in the world short course athlete? Uh, I have to say it was actually a quite a, a difficult period for myself. Um, um, because yeah, no, no one's going to come to you. And I mean, I didn't openly say that I was going to leave Joel, uh, Filion and, and his squad, uh, as well. So basically no one knew that I was yeah. going to change. So no one's going to come to you if, if, uh, if they think you're perfectly happy, but I, I wasn't, uh, I mean, I was, I was quite happy still but i think just yeah at some point you just need a change and uh and i think this is going to be my last olympic cycle and i will really have regrets if i never uh tried like a slightly different approach yeah so you put that on your i went through all your instagram stories uh pre- preparing for this actually and i saw i saw that i thought that's a that's a really good justification i think is yeah you know you've got one more roll of the dice you want to make sure you you don't leave any any stone unturned um Mm-hmm. Speaking of the Olympics, fourth place is that the worst place to finish at the Olympics, or do you think it's are you are you, are you like now nah, fourth's good, or is it like God damn it, I was so close? Like what what's that like? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it's I think for sure it's the worst place that you can get, but I think on the day that's what I deserved. Not that I deserve to be punished or something, but <laughs> 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 this sounds this sounds a bit weird, but no. Um, I think that's that was just it on the day. Like Christian, He's, Alex, and Hayden were better, and um, you got the best at yeah, yourself. It, You're comfortable with that with that finish because you got the best at yourself on the day, essentially. Yeah, that that's what I mean. Yeah, like I I, I worked really hard for it. Um, it was a scenario that was completely um, uh, not good for who I am as an athlete uh, for my strength. So I am actually quite proud of finishing fourth, but it's also yeah, a little bit annoying because if I had a medal, maybe I could have moved on to long distance. Uh, but now I'm I'm very hungry to to have one more shot. Yeah, because we saw on your Instagram, you said that if you had to pick between an Olympic gold and Kona, you would pick Kona. So, like you say, if you had a medal at this Olympics, you'd move on to long course. What is it about Kona that puts it above the Olympic gold for you in your head? I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I I really don't know because if you if you ask me in, in two weeks, maybe I'll say the other way. So I think it's for me it's actually super super uh, equal, but Kona just has that extra thing inside our sport um, that I don't know. Maybe it's the highest attainable. Well, yeah, we are know. starting to see more short course athletes do both, you know, short course and long course at the same time. Maybe, maybe we'll see you make that that, that surprise appearance uh, at Kona this year. <laughs> Who knows? Uh seventy point three worlds is that on the radar this year at all? Are you considering that? No, we, we, we've seen you now, the Ooh. world record holder. It suddenly puts you right up there. And I mean, not that it didn't already, but is is that on your radar now? I'm not saying yes or no, but are you thinking about it? In, yeah, I mean, actually, actually, not really. I'm not really okay. thinking about it because it doesn't fit with the World Series. people just sigh of relief, I think. <laughs> <A few people. laughs> oh, <my> God. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't fit with the with the World Series schedule. And um, yeah, like, I, I'm not completely counting it out. I was doubting first to maybe not even accept the slot, but I'm because I got another email just then. Uh, but I'm actually going to accept it. And you never know because... Uh, well, they're adding more World Series to the season uh, and you only have to do five of them. And I think by now there's already seven or maybe even eight. So who knows? It might be possible in the end, but I'm not counting on it. And so the, 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 message, the message to media heads like us is, yes, I'm going to accept it, but you're going to see my name on the start list. Don't get overexcited because I'm probably not going to race it. 
Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. I, I reckon this is mind games, James. I reckon he's just saying yeah, this because yeah. he wants all the other people to hear this and be like, oh, okay, we don't need to worry about Martin Venry and then he'll just pop up on race. They'd be like, yeah. no, 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 you all made a huge yeah, mistake. Yeah. You think You've I'd miss this party? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> that's it. I'm trying, trying to play the underdog again. <laughs> I also saw on your Instagram you were asked about the the Phoenix Project sub seven sub eight race, and you said you're actually going to go for a sub five. Uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts about the event? Would you get involved as a pacer, and how would you approach the race if you were doing it? Um, yeah, <laughs> I have to see what I say because uh, <laughs> Phoenix. Uh, if you want to sponsor me, you're always welcome. But. Uh, no, Don't worry, um, I uh, I replied to you as Phoenix. I'm the one who went back to you and said, "Let's organize." Ah, so. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, so uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of like it. it's it's the same thing with world records for me. I, I I don't really like it, but I know that it has the 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 chance to maybe get more people interested into the sports. Uh, like the same with the two hour record of of Elliot Kipchoge. Um, like it's a it's a chance to really show the outside world like what people are maybe capable of. Um, so yeah, if it attracts people that want to want to watch our our beautiful sport or start to follow it uh, for uh, yeah because they think we're superhumans, for instance, uh, <laughs> I think that's cool. But um, yeah, my only problem actually a little bit with it is that uh, the the pacer thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I kind of like made the, the joke about like oh, opening, a da opening a dam and stuff. Um, <laughs> it's just we, that like... We should do it. Where, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but like I, I, didn't, I don't really understand like where the point comes from of having pacers, especially on the bike, because on the run doesn't matter so much on the swim. But um, you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. is the next record, are they then going to have like 30 pacers or and do a sub 645 project or something like that. Um, I think it's interesting to see see where where uh, the body of a triathlete can go and where Christian and uh, Alistair and, well, Nicola maybe not anymore and Lucy can go. But, um, um, yeah, it's an interesting concept. So then if you were to take away the pacer element of it and have it just pure human, long course, the own, you know, by yourself, what do you think is the what at where we stand now? Because I know that the, the line is always moving. But what do you think is the the current? Let's say you've got the seventy point three world record. How much faster do you think that record can be moved in the next couple of years? And where do you think the limit is for an Ironman? Um, for, I actually believe that when uh, I, I heard a podcast with uh, Olaf Alexander, who's a scientist of Norway, and I actually believe he said that he believes that Christian can do uh, seven hours flat, uh, also without any uh, rules or help or whatever. And I actually, I actually think I can, I can believe that, or at least, yeah, get very close to seven and on a course with with no currents or no, no things. Um, yeah, I think everything is developing very, very fast. Um, and I can't see why, if the conditions were the same as on my race, why um, n n someone else cannot go five minutes faster because I don't believe I'm a superhuman myself. I believe there is always going to be someone someone better uh, at, at some point. So maybe we could see Christian Blumenfeld rock up to sub-7. He's decided, because he's not announced any of his paces yet, maybe he's gone... Actually, guys, I'm going to do this thing solo. I'm just going to go myself. It wouldn't surprise me with Christian actually if he's doing something crazy like that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. He might. Eh? He might. <laughs> crazy guy. <laughs> he certainly is. Well, look, Martin, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you. We were both so impressed. Uh, I actually did get to watch you race on the weekend because we did find there was there actually was coverage of the event, and it was actually pretty good for the first. I don't know, 10K if you run and then it was just not so good. But uh, congratulations. It was it was, it was was fantastic. I mean, your, your season last year alone was incredible too. I know that it was not quite the top, but, uh, you know, it was great to see you out there racing all the time, pushing the pace and, and having a real impact on the results. If people want to find out more about you, uh, where do they find you online? 
Uh, yeah, TikTok mainly. <laughs> no, no. Uh, well, actually, I am on TikTok, but uh, uh, <laughs> probably Instagram is where I where I uh, post the most. Yeah, and try to keep cool, everyone mate. updated. Excellent. Love the way you race, mate. Look after yourself, eh? Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Cheers. And we're back, mate. Mark Van Real, one of my favorite pro triathletes at the moment. I thought that was a fantastic chat with him. He's a, he's a really good bloke. Ah, oh, he's a good bloke and he's a geezer. I like him. I like him a lot. He's, uh, you know, someone who uh, he relates easy and uh, he gives a damn good interview as well. So really, really enjoyed that chat, mate, this morning. There was a point when I, because there was actually a broadcast I found, uh, uh, for the same person who told me that, no, who, no, Cat Matthews sent me the link. And... I saw it, it was it was on the it was it, straight to Martin Van Roo on the run course, and I thought, oh, "Fucking hell, he is running like he's being chased." I, I could not believe how fast he was running. I was a bit worried that like, he might blow up here, and he didn't. He just kept going and going and going and going. The guy is class. And, and as he said yeah. in the interview, man, he reckons that if Christian had been there pushing him, he had an extra gear. One of them would have blown up. I love that. This is why we want the battles, mate. This is why we yeah, want to yeah. see those these great athletes head to head. I hope at like Bahrain this year or Dubai next year, we just get an absolutely stacked field and see how fast they can. It's early enough in the season that it doesn't impact anything really. So you can have all the ITU guys, you can have all the long course guys use it as a season opener and just like, come on, Waterfall, Waterfall Bank, if you're listening, if you heard that we were critical of you, here's my idea. What you should do is you should create a prize that's based on finish times. So the world record is now 3.2606. Every athlete for every minute they go under that time gets paid ten thousand dollars with a fifty thousand dollar bonus for the winner, and let's see how far under that time they can go. Come on, let's make this there happen. I want to see it. That's the way to use money in the sport, and also, you know, this leads nicely onto our next topic, which is um, the fact that you want to see the big hitters racing each other. You want to see the big battles, and that is what we're starting to see from promoted by the PTO. Because, um, you know, like they, like Lionel Sanders said, welcome to the down low on the PTO. Like Lionel Sanders said in one of their interviews on Instagram recently, you're... you're, you're <laughs> like you're, Lionel Sanders said, welcome. <laughs> that, that, fam that famous Lionel Sanders quote. <laughs> you're going to slowly start to see... A transition away from the normal listeners racing of the calendar. Listeners of the podcast, I would like you to please try, if you ever see Lionel Sanders at a race, get him, <laughs> get a soundbite of Lionel Sanders. Or Lionel, if you're listening, I know you do. Come on the podcast, mate, and we'll get you to say welcome to the download of the PTO. And then that can be the official welcome to the download uh, PTO. We'd you. love that, wouldn't we? <laughs> so good. So yeah, and he gave an interview on the on the PTO's Instagram recently where he was saying, look, with the emergence of this PTO Pro Tour and the prize money they're offering and the names that you're going to see racing it, that is going to become the season for long course athletes and you're going to start seeing the battle because he made the point that the, you know, the races are so spread out and the races avoid each other actively avoid each other because they want that payday they don't want to, if there's five people racing and you finish fifth you're not even getting enough to cover your flights the pto are bringing in a tour where there will be prize money on the line so you're not going to have um, athletes avoiding each other anymore and you're going to have the very best racing across their calendar and so um you know and what i wanted to make the point i wanted to make within this download on the pto is that within challenge miami this weekend We've got um, f four of the top eight bikers in the sport on the PTO leaderboard all racing each other. And that's the level of insight that the professional triathletes ranking system brings to triathlon because you've got the number one biker on the PTO bike leaderboard, Magnus Ditlev, racing the number two biker on the PTO leaderboard, Sam Long. Excuse me, James Bell. I feel like you've done Magnus a disservice here because... It clearly has his full name on the leaderboard. Yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, I'm not sure how I'd to like pronounce to, that. I'd like to hear you try, please. Magnus Elbak Ditlev, I assume. Number five, 
Number Very five good. on the bike leaderboard, and Andreas Dreitz is also racing, and number eight on the PTO's bike leaderboard, Andrew Starkovitz is also racing. So four of the eight top bikers all going up against each other, and what the PTO brings is our ability to know that. Rather than just sense it, we know with metrics and with data that those athletes are racing each other and how exciting it's going to be. I actually really, one of the things I am so excited about with this race is seeing uh, Magnus L back Ditlev and Sam Long face each other. I'm I'm yeah. very curious to see how much Magnus has improved in the last 12 months at this race. And and again, I think Sam Long, you know, everybody when he first came on was saying that this guy's just talk. He's not talk. He's a he's a very, very good athlete. So I'm really curious to see how these guys go because I consider them very similar athletes. Uh and you're right, like this bike power is like those are four very, very serious bike names. Andreas Streitz, Andrew Starkowitz, Sam Long, Magnus Ditlev. Maybe we should get Magnus to become like like Bono. Just drop the Magnus L back and just be Ditlev. I reckon that'd be pretty cool. Ditlev. Just be Ditlev. Constantly wears just, sunglasses. Yeah, you know, exactly. never seen without his sunglasses. Correct, James Bale. If people want to get more of our funny jokes and laughing at each other and a whole bunch of other stuff, they can head to mxendurance.com forward slash podcast where they can sign up for one of our podcast memberships. We had a few people sign up this week, so thank you. Welcome. Uh, we do bonus monthly episodes with Chris McCormack. I have to do that with him. I've been overseas, but I'll get that sorted this week before he heads overseas again. Uh, you get a whole bunch of other discounts, benefits, good things, supports the podcast, gets us to do camps and bonus shows and all sorts of good stuff. Uh, it's good. mxendurance.com forward slash podcast. James Bell, if they want to find out other things about MX, where do they need to go? If you want to find out more about MX Endurance, head to mxendurance.com or search MX Endurance on Facebook or at MX Endurance on Twitter or Instagram. If you want to follow me, I'm at bail.james85 on Instagram, or you can follow Tim at tford14 on Instagram. Jump onto iTunes, give the show a review. You can do it in the podcast app. really helps the show out, and it's super easy. If you like what we're doing, tell a friend, help us grow. If you've got any comments, suggestions, criticisms, send an email to podcast at mxendurance.com and go to our website, the MX Endurance website, to sign up for the camp. Information is there and ready. Links in the show notes below if you're on YouTube or wherever you're in your podcasting. Uh, James Bell, the other thing I should say is welcome because our download numbers have gone up a lot lately. I don't know why. Probably the excellent content. But, yeah, welcome. Welcome to all of our new listeners. So, yeah, yeah. This, like, it's crazy. It, it scares me sometimes to see how many people listen to this podcast. I go, oh, shit. I hope they're not, hope they're not young for now. And, but if you're Lionel, if you're Lionel Sanders... Firstly, come on the podcast, Lionel. We want you. We want you on the podcast. Oh, yeah. Secondly, can you please do the sound grab? Welcome to the download of the PTO. Make that happen, listeners. Weaponizing yeah, yeah. you. Pester Go. him. Pester, pester him. him. Pester him. <laughs> or pester Talbot to do it. Talbot Cox, if you're listening, get that sound grab for us. We want it. It would be so good. <laughs> James Bell, see you next week, buddy. Always a pleasure. Take care.